Hi hey everybody, Paul McCartney's debut album McCartney is officially half a century old now. It came out on the 17th of April 1970. I'm going to discuss how it came to be and what I think of it all these years later. If you like this video please consider hitting that subscribe button because I do plenty more videos on this kind of subject. So I'm going to talk about this album not in the order of the track list that appears on the album but more in terms of the, the progression that went through as the album was being recorded. Because this album really comes from four different phases of recording sessions for the album. We're going to look at each one in turn. So, back in autumn of 1969, the Beatles had recorded Abbey Road, it had been released, and although there was a few recording sessions that still went on in uh, January 1970 to finish off some of the Let It Be material, Essentially, the Beatles were finished, even if it hadn't been announced yet. John had announced it to the band, um, but, but the band themselves hadn't really sort of decided that that was the end of the day yet. And even for McCartney, that wouldn't come until right just before the release of this album. So, why he decided to do a solo album at this point, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it could have been the fact that uh, John had been working on solo material, you know, he'd done Give Peace a Chance. Uh, he'd been working on things like, uh, well, it, it was shortly to work on things like Instant Karma. George had released a couple of sort of electronic albums and uh, and Ringo it even was doing his first album, Sentimental Journey. So maybe Paul didn't want to get left behind here, even if he didn't know for sure that the Beatles were finished at this point. But anyway, right at the back end of 1969, the recording sessions for this album started. <laughs> First of the four phases of recording this album started in December 1969 at Paul's home in London, Cavendish Avenue. He had a Studer four track recording machine delivered to the property and the first recordings that he did were actually really just to test the machine but, but these mainly ended up on the album. So as you'll know the opening song Lovely Linda that was that was his main one to sort of test the machine. That was a song that he'd written earlier up in Campbelltown up in Scotland. And uh, Valentine Day and Mama Miss America that also appeared on the album were also just Paul really testing out the machine and learning how it worked and what it could do. He also recorded That Would Be Something and the Glasses instrumental where he, you know, wet the rim of the glasses and, and that appears at the end of Hot as Sun. So all those are really the first phase of the album that he did at home on this Studio 4 track. The second of the four phases really was very much a sort of a continuation of the first in that these were still home recordings but they were then taken to Morgan Studios which is in, in London in February 1970 for them to be to be added to more overdubs and, and generally made a bit more polished. So he'd done uh, Junk and Sing Along Junk, Ooh You and Teddy Boy. They, those were sort of home recordings but then were expanded at Morgan Studios in February 1970 and that was really the sort of second phase of the recording of the album. <laughs> So that was the end of the home recordings and you can sort of see when you look back with hindsight and you look at the recordings that were done at home they were all they were much more basic than some of the other things that were on the album so they were all either to test the machine or things like uh, junk and teddy boy had been things that had been left over from Beatles sessions before so it's things that he already had that he was presumably hoping that he could use in some way. So the next phase of the album recording was in February 1970 when he completely moved to Morgan Studios in Wilsdon in, in London and there he did Crean of Crow and Hot Sun and I love Crean of Crow, the, the way that it's mic'd, the sort of closeness of the mic, I mean it's, it's uh, as you'll know it's, it's, it's a very much a sort of a drum track, it's almost, it reminds me a bit of Moby Dick by uh, Led Zeppelin um, and it's interesting to see that Led Zeppelin 2 or some of Led Zeppelin 2 was actually recorded also at Morgan Studios so maybe that that sort of the the engineers there and the mic placements that they used enabled him to get a, a kind of a similar feel to what would have been on, on something like that track uh, but I, I love the way that the the mic's up close on his breath and you can hear him getting out of breath as he's playing the drums and it's just a it's a fabulous song I think I know it gets it gets completely overlooked and a lot of people probably don't give it a lot of time of the day but I really enjoy listening to that song as much as most things on the album 
Uh, but but those sessions there he'd done under the name of Billy Martin, uh, which was a pseudonym that he was using. He didn't want it to be known that Paul McCartney was going into studios to record on his own. So he used this pseudonym Billy Martin as he, as he would later at Abbey Road uh, and recorded those two songs there, as well as doing overdubs on the stuff that he'd already um, recorded at home. It's interesting that he recorded Hot as Sun. I don't know if that was due to lack of material or what, but this was a song that originated from the 1950s. This was a song that the Quarrymen performed live. So, uh, I mean, I'm sure that he'd not really done anything with it for sort of well over 10 years, uh, but maybe he needed extra tracks so it was something that he felt comfortable playing. Uh, and that was something else that he recorded while they were at Morgan Studios. And then we move on to the final fourth phase of the recording of the album, which was from the 21st of February 1970 onwards. He moved into EMI Studios on Abbey Road. And it's really interesting that he was there on some days the same time as Phil Spector was there uh, making the Let It Be album. But again, Paul was there. He booked the studio under, under the name of Billy Martin to try not to arouse suspicion. But did Phil know that Paul was in the building? Did Paul know that Phil was in the building? I, I, I certainly can't see that Paul knew about that because uh, that would have been interesting had he found out that that was going on. But anyway, Paul was there from the 21st of February. The day after that, the 22nd of February, he created, recorded uh, probably the two sort of standout songs on the album, Every Night and Maybe I'm Amazed. And every night, looking back on it now, when you since the archive collection came out several years ago and Paul sort of talks about how difficult that period of his life was for him, it becomes a lot easier to sort of see that he was putting that in his lyrics, like John did with Help uh, five years earlier. Paul was sort of just sort of telling the world, really, you know, every night I just want to go out, I want to get out of my head. He wasn't coping well with the, the fact that the Beatles was dissolving, that, that band that he'd been in since he was sort of... 15 years old uh, and he's really laying it bare on tape there but to produce um, Maybe I'm Amazed in Every Night in One Day brilliant like it a few years earlier when he'd done uh, I'm Down and Yesterday on the same day you know sometimes he just knocks two completely out of the park in a day uh, ju just sort of showing the genius of the guy the other song that they recorded uh, that he recorded at Abbey Road was Man We Was Lonely which is a strange song on the album uh I have nothing against it, but it just feels like one of those songs that maybe once he'd written it, he should have just given it straight to Mary Hopkin or somebody similar to that. It's uh, it's the kind of song that had he written it a couple of years earlier, let's say around the time of the White Album, he probably would have given it to somebody. But maybe he needed the songs at the moment. Uh, but it made it onto the album and, and there you go. Uh, I, th I think looking at these whole four sessions, it's really interesting to think that if he started it in December 1969, this is just four months after he was working on the medley on side B of Abbey Road. And you just think about that. That's one of the great sides of music in history uh, and just how how well produced and everything it is and you compare that to the sort of homegrown McCartney album it's incredible that there's only four months difference between the two did he want to get completely away from that kind of thing um, and, and just do something completely different maybe did he not have it in him at the time maybe you know does it take a little while to build up those creative juices I don't know um, I'm not I don't have those creative juices that McCartney has, so it's difficult for me to answer. But it's incredible that there's such a contrast between uh, two albums that he was making just four months apart. So with the album recorded, it was scheduled for release on the 17th of April 1970. Now this set alarm bells ringing with the rest of the Beatles because the following Friday, the 24th of April, had originally been scheduled for the release of the Let It Be album. And they didn't want Paul releasing an album so close to this. So famously, Ringo took a letter that had been written by John and George, apparently by all, mean, by all accounts a friendly letter, but saying, this is why we think that uh, we shouldn't have two releases so close together. Ringo went to Cavendish House, to Paul's house, and delivered this letter on his doorstep. And... Paul did not like this at all. He basically sort of threw Ringo off the doorstep, told him to get lost. Um, and at that point, McCartney said that is the moment that he decided he'd had enough of the Beatles and he was leaving. So because McCartney wasn't shifting on his release date, Let It Be then had to be put back to the 8th of May for release. So when Paul issued review copies of the album uh, on the 9th of April, uh, he sent out an interview 
it was like a, it was like an interview that he'd done with himself really questions and answers where he talked about the uh, what he saw as the future relationship between him and the Beatles in it there was questions along the lines of why are you making a solo album and his answer was sort of effectively well I've got I have more fun with my family than I do with the Beatles and he was asked if he ever saw Lennon and McCartney becoming an active songwriting partnership again and there was a one word answer no so like I say that was on the 9th of April 1970 the following day the 10th of April the Daily Mirror uh, newspaper decided to run with this story and they went with the headline Paul quits the Beatles and that's become the date that's associated with the Beatles breaking up even though Paul actually wasn't saying that the Beatles were breaking up at that point he was just really saying that he wasn't sure in what way it was going to carry on so that was the, the world sort of saw the Beatles as breaking up on the 10th of April and then the following Friday McCartney is released to the world his debut solo album so let's have a look at the album. So originally McCartney intended that this was to be the front cover of the album, even though now it's, it's generally regarded that that's the cover of the album. Absolutely love this photograph. This is Paul with baby Mary, who is just a, obviously a few months old at the time, as you can tell. Um, and just the way that he's holding her close, it's a beautiful photograph. Um, this, for years, I, I assumed that this was a painting because even when you look at it now, it just it looks like a really good painting. Uh, but this was this was a photograph that Linda took when they were on holiday in Antigua, um, obviously before the release of the album, of course. And when you look at the original photograph, you can actually see that this is sort of a ledge that this is on, and you can see the ground either side of it. But it's been edited to to black that out. But the original photograph is in the McCartney Archive Collection book, um, and you can see clearly that it is an actual sort of uh, the top of a wall. But so yeah, become known as the Cherries cover. Um, really great album cover, and a fantastic photo at the back. Um, and then the gatefold sleeve there, really nice, sort of showing lots of photographs of Paul, Linda, Heather, and Mary uh, on holiday in various locations, or up in Scotland, up uh, up near Campbelltown on, on Paul's farm. And it just sort of really shows the the home life that he was loving at the time, uh, family life, which was obviously. Uh, a new thing for him and that become really important to him so yeah cracking uh, cracking album cover there when it was released this album didn't really get a great reception at all I think critics couldn't understand why it was so sort of uh, low-key half-finished songs especially like I say when you compare it to Abbey Road a few months earlier and the uh, sort of what a massive production effort that was so I think it just sort of confused people I absolutely love this album um, when I did my McCartney rankings, I can't remember the exact placing, but it was it was pretty high up there. Uh, I just think it's a great album to listen to. If you want to know who Paul McCartney is, this album's going to tell you that, because apart from a few backing vocals from Linda, there's nobody else on this album. You listen to something like Maybe I'm Amazed, you know, that's Paul drumming. It's Paul on bass. He's playing lead guitar. He's playing piano. He's singing it. He produced it. It is in essence, it's the essence of Paul McCartney. He's singing about his favourite topic in the world, which was Linda. And it's just, if you ever want to get sort of a concentrated flavour of what Paul McCartney is, listen to this album, or Maybe I'm Amazed, and it gives you a real good idea of, of really what the man was about at that period in his life, when he was he was really struggling with the breakup of the Beatles. Um, I mean, it was like a family breaking up. It was all he'd ever known. He must not have known what was going to follow was that was that it for him as a as a pop star as a rock star he wouldn't have known at the time you know he would probably have been wondering do i have to go and get a job now you know he didn't know what his life was going to be over the next sort of 50 years and that he would still be paul mccartney rock star to this day that was certainly uh, not a question he had an answer to at that time so 50 years on i think this album is a great sort of historical document of where he was at in his life at the time um, and and he obviously went on to to sort of discover the bigger productions again. I think it's really interesting that the next album, Ram, when you look at things like Backseat of My Car, um, Uncle Albert, uh, there are things where he's starting to get back into those bigger production numbers again. Because uh, I don't think he would he would have been able to keep away from it forever. Uh, but maybe he just wanted a break from that for a little while. I don't know. But this album, it's uh, it's a great testament to him and uh, one that I still listen to regularly and absolutely adore.
So I'm certainly going to be playing that album tonight in honour of the 50th anniversary. There's my thoughts on it. I'd love to hear yours as well in the comments. Uh, let me know what you think of the album. But thank you very much for watching. I say please subscribe. I'll be doing a lot more of this kind of stuff as, as more 50th anniversaries come along over the next few months and years. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Bye bye.